Good morning, y'all festers. Uh, welcome to the second day of Y'all Right. We have had a blast so far. Uh, the first day has been a smash success. We had wonderful uh, panels and uh, master classes and some great stuff on Instagram. You should check it all day, and it's being saved to our IGTV uh, channel. So really excited to have everybody a part of the festival. Uh, we had 65,000 discreet viewings yesterday uh and we expect to top that today so it's been a wonderful experience for everybody and we hope you're enjoying all of our craftiness and all of the things um that everybody's been going on this is breakfast with y'all right uh this is your y'all right team sort of a showcase discussion of craft techniques and sacred writing tips from your friends at y'all right so what that means is each of the individual um, workers on our Y'all Right team are going to come out and they're going to give you their favorite go-to craft tip. Uh, and I am your host, Brendan Reichs. I'm author of the Project Nemesis series, the Viral series, and the uh, Dark Deep series with Ali Condi. And I am going to be hosting you and taking you through this morning. So hopefully you guys are ready to go. I'm ready to go. And we're going to have our first guest come on. She is the author of Blue Bloods, Alex and Eliza, the co-author of Joe and Lori, and author of the Descendants series, and a thousand other things, which is a beast down. You guys have all heard of her. Please welcome to the show this morning, Melissa De La Cruz. Good morning. Hello, Brendan. Good morning. Brendan. And I know it is a good morning for you. It is super early on the West Coast. Uh, so if anyone's watching it from the West Coast, we appreciate you joining us. But um so uh, I just wanted to introduce you, and we're going to start off by saying, first of all, just tell everybody what you're working on like right now. What's your current project, um, what they can expect from you? Uh, so I'm working on the second Never After book, and the first Never After book is coming out December 1st. All right, all right. So as you know, the assignment given to our Intrepid team was give the audience your favorite, your go-to craft technique uh, uh, or tip that you want to share with the world that you've been hiding to yourself and maybe shouldn't give away but are going to right now. So go ahead and tell us what you know. <laughs> uh, so my favorite craft tip is uh, I think the first writing tip I ever got uh, as a feedback from an editor way, way before uh, I had ever sold a book. Actually, he told me he was not buying my first novel uh, because of this problem. Uh, he eventually bought uh, my third novel, which was published as my first novel. So he said, um, the, uh, you have to introduce the romantic interest by page 30. You know, if you have not introduced, uh, you know, the person that your hero or heroine is going to be interested in by page 30, your book is too long. <laughs> it is too much of a slog. You know, you are not on pace. You know, so it's a very simple um, but uh, very effective technique, I think. And, uh, you know, I do notice if I haven't gotten, you know, that person on the page uh, before page 30, that the book does kind of drag. So... Get your romantic interest in before page 30. <laughs> and sort of when you're when you're crafting that romantic interest, like how do you know how to bring them in? Like, is it sort of do you like to sort of slam them into the character or is it somebody you like to sort of slow build in the background? Or is there is there a way you like to bring that person into the fore or is it just like, boom, here it is and put a bright neon <laughs> sign over that person. Better pay attention. Um, I think the rule is pretty flexible. Like you can even just mention them. You know, just say, oh, in passing, there's whatever, Dan is walking around, you know, but it, it has to be there. It has to be at least built. It has to be something, a seed of something by page 30, you know, and page 30 is pretty early in the book, you know, so it doesn't have to be boom. Oh, my God, there he is. You know, although I do, I do like the, oh, my God, there he is. <laughs> I do kind of like that introduction to the romantic hero. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to hit you with a question about craft just that you've heard. So what is the best craft tip that was ever given to you by another writer? Like in your career, somebody sat you down and said, hey, listen, this is what I do. And you were like, man, that's a really smart idea. You know, do you have anything that you sort of draw on every book and you kind of remember like, wow, I'm glad that person told me that? Um, you know, Margie and I uh, wrote Joe and Lori together. And even before then, uh, you know, we're, we were a little bit each other's critique partners and we would uh, send each other's, each other's books. And I think Margie's tips was always, you know, kind of digging into the emotion. You know, what is this character feeling? You know, can we have a little bit more of that? Because I tend to kind of hold back on that a little bit. But, you know, whenever she does a pass on my books, she's always like, let's, 
let's really feel that, you know, and which I think is really important if you're going to write for young adult. I think you really want to feel um, all the emotions that the uh, characters are feeling. You know, it, it's really an immersive experience. <laughs> All right, and finally, I'm going to leave you with uh, give me the quarantine skill that you're most proud to have acquired during this, uh, we'll just call it a disastrous year in 2020. Uh, what, what, what have you learned uh, that you can most apply, that you can take out of uh, some of the mess that we've had to live through? <laughs> I, I know, it's, it's really strange. Um, you know, I, we've never been home this much before. Um, you know, we're usually always traveling, either for work or on vacation. Um, and I have learned menu planning and cooking, <laughs> which is so strange for me. Like the other day I cooked dinner at three o'clock because I, we had to go to cheer practice. And usually we get home a little late from cheer practice and then we have to order and then it takes forever and everybody's hungry. But this time I was like, oh my God, if I just cook dinner early, you know, we'll be home and then we can have a meal. And that's what we did for the first time ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is definitely a noble skill. I'm also glad to know that you have joined a cheer squad. We're all going to look forward to seeing you perform in that very Oh, soon. my daughter. My daughter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, Melissa, thank you for joining me this morning. And I'm probably sure you're going to go right back to bed. So really, just jump back in on the West Coast. But thank you so much. And thank you, Brendan. we're going to move on to our next guest in the morning. Uh, she is the co-author of Beautiful Creatures. Uh, she also wrote the Black Widow series and co-authored uh, Joe and Lori. So if we could please have Margaret Stoll join us in the interview room. There she is. You got a little whiteboard action going there on there behind you? You know, I live in a whiteboard room. Literally all my walls. Soon it will be the ceiling. But yes. Listen, people that know us know that no one could possibly care more about whiteboards than the two of us. I have several flanking me, but I'm afraid to put them out there because it'll expose my uh, my uh, mania to the rest of the world so i know uh, i had to pick which one i could sit in front of because it's also you, top you do have to be careful because if you put the wrong one out there and you realize you just put a non-published book behind you with all the plot <laughs> points listed out in, in intricate detail uh that can be a mistake so yep. margie tell me what you're working on right now uh you know i write comics and i make video games and i write books so i just finished a comics run for spider-man Spider-Man Noir, which was honestly one of the most fun jobs I've ever had. And right now I'm actually uh, working on a Marvel uh, a game I can't talk about in another game. And then I have a book with Mel that we're working on our second book uh, from working together uh, from writing Joe and Lori. It's my most fun thing about talking with authors is the I can't tell information. And people yeah. might get annoyed by it, but it's absolutely true. Uh, there's so much you can't talk about so far well, in advance. Marvel so, will hunt you down and kill you, so you have exactly, to be very careful. Exactly. All of our agents are watching this while we're doing it, and they're being very careful with this. So, Margie, go ahead. Hit me with your number one go-to craft tip. Uh, okay. Well, anyone who knows me knows I mostly like to talk about... Um, I have a famous uh, school visit I do that's called uh, you, you Don't Suck. Basically, no one can suck at everything unless you are a cephalopod or a pseudopod, and even then you wouldn't suck at sucking, so I rest my case. But I've decided that that's wrong, and um, it's really important to suck and to figure out sort of why and how you do and to use it. So my advice is officially don't jump to suck. Suck is a process state. That's a piece of advice given to me by pseudonymous Bosch. All things suck. Your next book sucks. Your last book sucks. It's just an important thing to accept and move on. It's kind of like that kid's book, Everybody Poops. Do you have that? I was looking I, for the I'm familiar with the poop book, yes. I was looking for the spit take there. You were drinking, and I was saying poop, and you really I let mean, me down there. I mean, you almost got me. It was very close. <laughs> and then, um, so I, you, my, my advice is lean in. Like always try to hear the hard thing. Actually, from my other work lives, I have a, uh, from games, I have this uh, post-it by my phone that says, how can this conversation be more uncomfortable? Um, which is a thing <laughs> I ask at the end of every conversation because guess what? Anybody can have the easy conversations, but the value lies in the hard conversations and the conversations people aren't having and the things you're not thinking about yet about your draft. So, Try to hear the hard thing. Um, try to like listen when people are trying to give you notes on your draft. Neil Gaiman has a famous quote that says, if everybody tells you there's something wrong with your book, they're usually right. And if they tell you how to fix it, they're usually wrong. 
And I kind of live by that. And then I'd also say lean in. When I'm teaching a writing class, I'll make uh, people write what they're like, what's the hardest part of the process for them? Because everyone's different. And then I'll make them write a character who's struggling with that problem. Because your suckage is your gold, man. People are like people are humans. All humans have problems and worry about things. And they like that's like the stuff you have that's uniquely yours. Um, and then you have to have a system for surviving it. I recommend the buddy system. Pseudonymous Bosch had to pick me out of a trash can yesterday. I was so low. I actually someone like a did. literal trash can or like yeah. A I was you know I was hovering in a trash can. No literal literal. <laughs> But like sometimes you just need the person who will sit on Zoom with you and force you to print the thing out and do your work. Um, so I I I'm a big believer in the buddy system. Actually, um, I you know I I've done that with with Mel. Is how we got through that last book. Is like the things you think are terrible, someone can reveal to you or not. And I think authors are unreliable narrators. So just don't. You have to know when to not listen to yourself. I never would have ever written a book without Cami Garcia basically sitting me down and saying, you can do this, we're doing this, write this book. Um, and then I would also say, uh, if you do all those things and pay attention to yourself, the bad bits as well as the good bits, you will build what in, uh, what in video games when you're building a universe we, is like the gold standard, which is something ownable. Right? Whatever you build should be ownable by you, ownable details, things that can only happen in your world, only happen in your book, only happen because you suck the particular way you do. So uh, pay attention to how you suck is how my advice has changed and use it, invest in it and, and make it work for you because it's, it's a gift, I promise you. All right. Well, that was uh, gorgeously timed and excellent advice. As always, the wonderful Margaret Stoll, thank you. Say for happy birthday. It's my birthday. Of I got up course. at seven on my birthday. So happy what? birthday to Margie, right. of course. And now we're going to switch to Alex London. He's the author of Black thank Wind's you. Beating, Proxy and the Wild Ones, and a lot of other stuff. So, uh, Sandy, you want to join us this morning? Good morning. There he is. He's got, oh, what well, shall we? Let's hold on. Let's, it's a morning show. It's a morning you know? show. It is. Let's have it. <clears throat> this is my dad mug made by my child. So yeah. Oh, nice. nice. This All is right. my South Park Ranch from the TV show Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, all of our young readers will, of course, immediately leap to that connection. Obviously. Uh, all right. So uh, it's also a lie because it's completely empty. I finished my coffee and just went to take a sip of an empty coffee. You had, you had us all fooled. You had us all yeah. See, that's the miracle of fiction right there. Just an example of it right there. All right. Tell me what you're working on. Tell the whole world what you're working on right now. So I just finished the um, where did it go? I had a lot of books here. Oh, there they are. I just finished the uh, Skybound saga that started with Black Wings beating Goldwing, Goldwings Rising just came out the end of an epic fantasy trilogy. And I am now working uh, on a new series of uh, kind of upper middle grade books that will be out next fall, the first one called Battle Dragons. Uh, they are basically the Fast and the Furious meets How to Train Your Dragon in a futuristic city. Take my uh, money, take my money. Right? Right? Yeah, right? Like, um, so the, the sort of big secret is I, I developed the idea with Scholastic and the moment we hit on that notion, that like phrase, I was like, well, I 12 year old me just freaked out. I have to write this. Exactly. Um, All right, so, Sandy, uh, tell me, what is the one tip that you've been hiding or that you rely on or your favorite, your, your craft go-to uh, thing that you're so, going to tell the world that you probably should never reveal? So my go-to thing is, I have to admit that I've published, I think, 26, to 27 books, something like that. I've got, I'm, I'm approaching 30. I have 30 under contract I will have, have published. So that's a lot of books, right? It's a uh, lot across, of books. Across age ranges, adult, children's, middle grade, young adult. Um, and the secret is I have no idea how to write a book. I have no clue how to do it. I don't really know how I do it. I'm kind of skeptical of writing advice generally. But what I do know how to do is uh, kind of echoing Margie is feel like a failure and feel like I suck at things um, constantly. So what I figured out how to do is to trick myself to give myself small attainable goals, tiny goals that I can achieve that aren't writing a book, but that are pieces of writing a book, like bite-sized things. So. I tell myself, okay, today I'm going to figure out this character's 
desire arc, like what they what they want and whether or not they're going to get it and what they're willing to do to get it. And I'm going to figure that out. I don't have to figure out the whole book and I can be wrong about this one thing. I'm going to figure that out. And that's in the planning process. I don't say I'm going to plan my whole book. I say I'm going to do this one thing. And then when I get down to actually writing a draft, I don't say I'm going to write a book or I'm going to write a chapter or I'm going to get this scene right. I say I'm going to write. I mean, now at this point in my career, it's about a thousand words a day. But um, during the height of the quarantine, when my toddler was home and my husband was home and we were all stuck here, I said, OK, I, I'm only writing during nap time. I'm going to give myself 500 words a day. I can write 500 words a day. Chances are, if I achieve that little goal, I'll get much, I'll blow right past it. But by giving myself a goal that is achievable, that is smaller than what I know I can do, it's easy. It's like writing a to-do list and putting the thing on top of it that is write to-do list. So you've got something to scratch off right at the top. <laughs> I do that with everything. So I do that with writing my book. Write 500 words today. Boom, done. I feel great. Oh, I did a thousand. I'm even better than I thought I would be. And you, that way, you leave. You don't feel like a failure the next day. And it's I think easier more than that. It, it helps you sort of avoid procrastination because a lot of times you're looking at a project and it's not just that feeling of failure, which believe me, I, I, I totally get. It's also that feeling of like, oh, there's so much to do and I don't know where to start. And so if you're like, I'm going to edit the first paragraph of this one you know, one chapter, that's it. That's, that's all yeah. I have to do today. You know, you'll find that next thing you know, you fly through it and you're like, Oh, okay, this is doable. And then once you start, you can kind of get going downhill. So yeah, I totally get what you're saying. Digestible chunks. Yeah. M Marie Lou talks about in video game design, the easy fun button, things that are easy to do and fun that keep you coming back to play the game. Like you hit that thing and it makes that sound and it's not hard, but it's like, blah, blah, blah. it's like how slot machines are designed. Right. Good you got to give yourself those as a writer. If you like crossing out things on a to-do list, give yourself writer to-do lists. If you like uh, uh, writing by page count, you know, format your documents so that your fonts are big and your margins are big and you get a lot of pages. Give yourself those easy, easy hits and it makes it easier to come back to the work. All right. So what is the first craft element that you sort of hone in and circle on when you're starting a new project? Like where, where do you, what do you start with? Do you start with character setting plot? Like what is it that gets you going on a project? I, I mean, for me, it's really like concept, which is especially cause I love genre stuff, fantasy and sci-fi. So it's sort of like concept world building and character. They all kind of come together. They're sort of a package, but they all, they all kind of bubble up. I mean, again, I said, I'm skeptical of writing advice because it's kind of like trying to describe how, fog moves across a field. Like, I don't know how or why it happened. Like lots of parts are moving at the same time. Um, if that's true. It's something I don't to do with barometric pressure. And I yeah, I don't know how fog works. Um, and I don't know how writing works. So it's it's kind of, I mean, actually I usually use the, the bonfire analogy where you're throwing a log on a bonfire and a lot of sparks come up. Uh, so like character and concept kind of emerge together. I get most excited about world building. Um, but I don't know that that comes exactly first. It kind of comes simultaneous. And I just, that, if, I, if I've got a cool world that I want to hang out in, uh, that's when I know like, oh, a project's right. Like I'm working on, secretly I can't say much about it because this is the world we live in, but on a, a sort of Christmas romance uh, thing uh, that's not a book. Um, and okay. knowing, knowing that I could write this small town, you know, Christmas romance, mm -hmm. I just wanted to spend time in that world. And the rest, the plot, everything came from that. Just wanting to hang out in the world. All right. Well, Alex, thank you so much for joining us this morning and we will see you uh, later in the day, perhaps. I'm not sure. But if not, uh, we appreciated all the advice. I'm going to not drink some more coffee. Do it. Because now we're going to go to Danielle Page, the author of Dorothy Must Die and Stealing Snow and Mira and a new project. So is Danielle in my green room? There she is. How are you doing this morning, Danielle? Hello, how are you? I'm great. I'm great. So uh, tell us about your current project, because I know you have one that you're working, you're, you're, you're talking about right now. So uh, the Ravens came out on election day <laughs> of all days. Oh, always a great release day. day. It was a really, yeah, really I know I'm doing anything else. for reading books. Yeah. <laughs> you can't even tell anybody, like, go buy my book. It's like, well, if you go vote and then you happen to see a bookstore, maybe you can stop by and pick. Ne no, never mind. Just vote. Like that was my day, right. and it was election week. Let's be clear, it wasn't election day. Like, no, it <laughs> dropped. It, the, it started on the the first day was election day. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so, what's a little? You wrote this book with a co-author, right? It's Cass Morgan who wrote the One Hundred. Um, we're really good friends, and we just had this. I like I had the idea a long time ago to do a sorority 
which book and I wanted to do it with a writer sister. And so Cass and I did it together and we had the best time. It's just, it's super like kind of a throwback to those movies like The Craft and 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 like Buffy. And we actually did a panel with Amber Benson, which was gonna show up on IGTV today with Cammie and Margie and Cass and oh, I, we had the best time. All right, so here we go. Your secret to success, your craft tip that no one knows about that you're gonna give the world right now. Give it to me. Okay, so I actually have a couple and they come from my time um, writing soaps. That was my very first job. I wrote for Guiding Light. Um, first I was an assistant and then I moved up to write um, and I also wrote for Days of Our Lives. And I took, I went to soap opera school um, they actually had a bunch of kids who wanted to get involved um, in soaps to take a class. And we had this teacher who was a development executive. And his one piece of advice was that at the end of every scene, you end it with a slap. Metaphorical slap or actual slap because it was a soap opera. <laughs> and, it was, and the idea is just that at the end of every scene, you build to something that matters, that makes either emotionally or, or physically, that makes you want to watch the next scene. And I treat chapters in my book like scenes. And I and so I, I still do that to this very day. So the just to, to build to something important, to make sure every moment on, scene, on screen counts, and I still do that. And I would actually, before you keep going, piggyback a little bit on that, because Ali Condi always says something smart. Uh, she was saying that if you get to the end of your chapter and you don't really know how to end it and it's kind of like sitting there and dangling, you've probably written too far and you actually might need to go back because you're ending. You, you went by it and you kept going, but you could have actually stopped earlier because that's where the, the, the metaphorical slap was uh, <laughs> and you just kept plowing through and then you got bored. You're like, wait, wait, did I miss the ending? So sometimes it's not that you need to keep going forward. It might be that you, you need to go back a little bit and find out where a good place to stop would be. Um, I love you know. that. That's absolutely true. Um, my other tip is, that I learned from soaps is that you can write anything. Write that big, crazy thing that you could not imagine. Um, I had the I, when I first started writing, I thought I could only write really small scenes that were basically about Danielle, like a single girl in the city or college girl. Like I, that was all I like. I wanted to keep it so small, and I think a lot of girls don't necessarily. Now there's so much YA that has have female protagonist and you see yourself on the page. But I never imagined myself writing comics. I never imagined myself writing um, fantasy. And now I'm so comfortable in that space. So Soaps taught me that to write. I, there were clones and ghosts and all these absolutely crazy things. And it, the, you just have to make the thing believable. Okay. Uh, give me the hardest aspect about writing for you? What what do you struggle with the most? And also if it's, or flip it over and say, what's the easiest thing that comes to you? Like, what do you do most naturally? Dialogue. Um, I feel like my script writing time makes it kind of natural for me. Like I, I can hear the voices in my head and just finding ways to distinguish voices I think is really important. Um, and Soaps did that. You had to write for like 20 characters. And what do you think you had the most trouble with? Or you continue um, to feel like you, you need to, an area you might need to grow. I feel like for me, I think when I'm writing prose, I still fall back on my script writing. So I like dialogue comes first, everything. And then everything else is, is more like writing the internal monologue for a character. I'm used to the kind of the show don't tell of television. And so having to switch over and say, what is someone thinking? What are they feeling? Like, make sure that that's on the page. Like, I will do a second pass on my book to make sure that I didn't miss all the things that are my TV things. So I, I like, when you write for TV, someone else does the wardrobe, someone else does the action, someone else does everything. You, you write the dialogue. So I do, I actually do like a, a wardrobe pass at the end. I do, a, uh, I do an emotional pass to make sure that I'm not missing something that I just, I was not my natural bent. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to ask you the first thing you intend to do after quarantine is lifted. What is your first thing to do? Get married. I'm engaged. <laughs> well, yeah. that's a good one. So I have to do that. <laughs> and All I'm very right, excited. I, like that. I feel like we, we, like, you know, you're waiting for something really special and you want your family to be there. So that's what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. You know, last thing you want your, 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 your marriage to be a super spreader event. Uh, so, yeah. you know. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, Danielle. Now we're going to shift uh, to our next person. Our next guest is uh, 
Soman Chainani, who is the uh, author of the School for Good and Evil series. So uh, if we could get Soman out of the green room, there he is. Soman, how are you doing this morning? I am good. What's happening? Oh, you know, same old. We're just doing a morning, a fake morning show over over the Internet for, uh, you know, tens of thousands of people. So, you know, that's a uh, very typical stuff. So tell me what you're working on now. And I know this may be a tough question for you. So give me what you can. I just finished doing a graphic novel collaboration uh, with Victoria Eviard called Red School, which is a combination of um, the School for Good and Evil series and the Red Queen series. And so that we just did this huge kind of launch of it the last couple of months. Uh, the School for Good and Evil series finished in June and the movie is going to start filming in April. Um, and then I have an untitled book coming out next October, which I'm going to announce in January, which I'm super excited about and is going to get me in so much trouble and I may not be allowed to ever write a book again. So we shall see. I like it. Untitled book about a specific thing at a later date. That's the kind of information that people are tuning in for this morning so that they can really feast upon it. Okay, give me your craft tip. I only start a book once I know what the character wants. And this is the number one thing that I talk to kids about and, and you know writers about is as soon as you know who your main character is, you better dig deep into what they actually want in life. So for instance, if you look at the School for Good and Evil, you have the character of Sophie, and Sophie wants to be a princess, right? And a lot of stories would want to stop there. A lot of Disney movies, in fact, stop there with a girl who wants to be a princess, right? And that's kind of the shallow want. And if that's where you're going to end, you're going to have a very boring book that no one's going to read, right? Because who wants to read a book about someone who wants to be a princess? No one except like four-year-old girls, right? So to me, what I wanted to do was go deeper and keep asking, why do the characters want what they want? What's the deepest level of want you can get to? So I said, why does Sophie want to be a princess? And I would think about this really for weeks on end. And I thought, what if she wants to be a princess because she wants to find love, right? Which, again, is too shallow, right? Why does she want to find love? Why is it so important to her? And I thought it's because her mother died and she's not getting enough love at home from her father, right? So I started thinking about what would that mean? What would it mean if, you know, she's at home and her father's busy with the new stepmother and new stepkids and not paying attention to her? Where would this need for love come from? And started thinking about the fact of maybe she wants a prince to replace her father, right? Maybe she wants a substitute father figure in her prince. So all of a sudden we went from having a girl who wants to be a princess, which is a very boring want, to now a girl who wants to find love because she needs a substitute father, right? So if you present a girl who's looking for a prince who's going to be a substitute father to replace <laughs> the sort of lost love in her life, all of a sudden you have a very different book. Right. So that's what I, I think is the most important craft tip I can possibly offer, which is think about what your character wants and why they want it and keep going deeper and deeper and de deeper until you hit kind of oil. Right. Mm -hmm. is, do they want to save their self-worth? Do they want to save their identity? Do they want to prove themselves superior? You know, all these things. And you can do it with people in life. It's fun to armchair psychologize your friends and family. I do it all the time. I always ask. Armchair ask people, psychologize. I like that. I like it. Why do, you, why do people want what they want, right? And I do it. Uh, Brendan and I teach at this um, camp every summer uh, called Write Out in Utah, run oh, by yeah. Ali Condi. And I do this to the kids for literally three days straight. I'm just like, what, why do you want? Like, they'll be like, I want to play lacrosse. And I'll be like, why? And we'll just keep digging until we figure out what is their motivating nugget. Um, yeah, I've had five-year-olds that also play the same game of just asking why, why, why over and over again. So, you know, you really can dig down deep in, inside somebody's head with that question. Give me the worst craft tip you've ever been given. What do you hear often that you just don't agree with, that you think is, uh, and that's maybe too strong, just what is something that you, you, you would give caution to or you have a little bit of a qualm with? I think sometimes you get this general life advice of follow your dream, follow your passion, write what you're passionate about, I think is really stupid. I think you have to find <laughs> something, <laughs> I know it's controversial, but I think you have to find something that you connect to. I think, look, I'm very passionate about like, you know, spy thrillers. I love watching them and have a good time, but could I write one? No, because I don't have like a, a personal, like, I, I can't find that root in myself, you know? So I think it's important that you find something that only you can do, not something that you're necessarily just like passionate and dreaming of doing. It has to be something that you can offer to the world, that you specifically have the voice to do. Um, and I think that's important is to think about if you come up with an idea for a book or a story, make sure that you're the only person who can do it. If there's someone on earth you can think of who can write the story better than you or someone that can write the story at all. 
Um, I don't think you should do it. I think you should focus on the things that you uniquely can provide to the world, which I know is controversial, but that's just the way I feel. What has been your go-to quarantine comfort food? What have you gone to back over and over and over again during this long haul of 2020? I'm laughing right now because my mouth is sort of full of it. I realized that I was running late on time and I was literally eating it and it's right over there. It's a melted peanut butter sandwich that I like put in the <laughs> microwave and then I melt it. But here's the funny part. I'm slightly allergic to peanut butter, so it makes my throat swell up and starts to make my sinuses swell, which is what's happening right now. But I so, can't stop doing it. This is my version so let, of smoking. Let me be clear. You eat a food that may kill you and you also chose to do so right before you went on my, my morning show. Um, I have to. I have to question the, uh, the this is, process going on. This there. is this is the Salmon equivalent of smoking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Salmon. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, okay, and okay. we're gonna join. We're gonna be joined now by our last guest, which is Cami Garcia. She's the co-author of the Beautiful Creatures series with Margaret Stoll. Also, has written a couple of DC comic graphic novels, Raven and Beast Boy. So please join me, Cami Garcia. Good morning, Cami. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm not getting sound from you. I muted myself. Oh, that's smart. See, that's just good Zoom etiquette. All right. So first, tell me what you are working on right this minute. Um, I can't tell you exactly what I'm working on. So I'll tell you what I just finished. I All just right. finished Beast Boy Loves Raven, which comes out next year. And uh, that's also a DC graphic novel. I'm super excited about. So that's what I just finished. And now I'm doing something secret. You probably know, but no one else can know. All right. Fair enough. I know. See, that's the, that's the curse that we all live with. We have so much fun, so many fun projects, and we can't ever talk about any of them for long periods of time. Okay. So give me your go-to craft tip for the world. So um, I know you're a big outliner. Um, I also am a plotter, but I know that some people are pansters and they feel uncomfortable plotting. So what I use is called a beat sheet and it's a, it's used in screenwriting. It's kind of like what you learn in school, like your main plot points. So I kind of make a map. I definitely do what Soman said. I figure out what my character wants. And once I know all that stuff, um, there is a great book. It's called Save the Cat Writes a Novel by, there we go, Jess Brody. Oh, and I had that myself, yeah. And she um, actually uh, did some Instagram stuff about it also this weekend. And um, what I do is I find my main plot points. And if you think of it as like a road trip, it's kind of like I'm going cross country in my story. And I know that I'm going to eventually get to L.A. But I know also that like in the middle, I'm going to stop in Chicago and eat pizza. So what I do is I figure out where are my main stops along my way to California? Am I going to stop in you know New Orleans, Chicago? Am I going to make a detour and go over and visit the Grand Canyon? Um, so one, so basically I plot those out like a roadmap. And then I, I do have a little pantsting. So if I know I started, I live in uh, Annapolis near Washington, D.C., so if I know I'm going to get started and maybe I'm going to stop it, uh, maybe quarantine is over. I'm going to go to y'all fest next year. I'm going to stop in South Carolina, Charleston. So what I basically do is I might not know exactly how I'm going to get to Charleston. Like I might not know if I'm going to stop on the way in North Carolina, if I'm going to go, if you're me, you're going to go to Bojangles on the way and get chicken. <laughs> so I might not know exactly how I'm, what route I'm going to take to Charleston, but I know who's in the car with me. Um, I know, you know, if there might be, sometimes I make a problem with the car, like the car is going to run out of gas on the way and I know I got to get to Charleston. So it gives me a little fun flexibility so that I can kind of be a little bit free and pantsy as I'm getting there. But I know I have to get to Charleston and usually I give myself a time limit. Like maybe I know I have to get to Charleston by, you know, page 50. So it gives me a little bit of structure. Um, in Save the Cat Writes a Novel, again, um, it gives you much more guidance than what I just described. Because we're obviously trying to do this, you know, I'm doing abbreviated. But screenwriters use it because it gives you the main plot points. Like we always talk about inciting incident. And we talk about midpoint. We talk about, you know, climax. Um, all these different plot points that a lot of the hero's journey, James Scott Bell uses it in his plot and structure. All these different craft books and craft gurus teach us these, but 
it's great because say the cat kind of condenses it into like a little cheat. I call it like a cheat sheet. And it's, it, it has changed my writing because I know where I'm going and I don't get lost as easily. Awesome. Well, Cammie, you are a perfectly timed guest, which I always appreciate it. So thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I guess I'm going to shoot a craft tip for the world out there. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Mine really involves openings. Uh, I think a lot of people have a hard time starting a book and they want to grip, you know, the reader from the first page, but sometimes they don't really quite know how to do it. And so my tip is usually when I am in a workshop or in any kind of setting like that, I will... Um, read someone's opening of their book and try and find the first conflict. For instance, if you start a book and it says, hi, I woke up in the morning, brushed my teeth, went downstairs. My mom and dad and my little brother were there and he's annoying. We had breakfast. I walked outside to school, missed the bus, which was a little bit boring. So I had to walk into school, went to my locker, opened it, put my math book in, closed it again, turned around. Somebody punched me in the face. Now I would go as I was reading that and I would circle the, uh, fist flew from the crowd and punched me in the face. I would circle that as the first conflict. And I would tell whoever I was uh, workshopping with that maybe they can cut everything above that and start your story right there, right at that conflict. Because the beginning of it is what you think is necessary background information, but usually is information that can be, can, can be supplied later. Uh, you don't need it to get the story started. And oftentimes if um, someone's going through a bookstore and they're flipping through a book, you know, they're gonna give you one, maybe two pages. And if you're not, if they're not gripped by them, they may not ever read you again. So <laughs> it's important to get that first conflict right on the page so you're immediately gripping the reader. And it's also, I wanna stress, it does not have to be a violent act. Uh, a lot of people think, well, it has to be a punch in the face. So I'll just start off with something like that. Absolutely not true. A great example of this is Becky Apertali's book, uh, Simon versus the Homo Sapiens Agenda. And I want to make sure I get uh, the, the line right. So I'm going to pull it up here. But it says, Simon's beginning is, it was a weirdly subtle conversation. I almost don't notice I'm being blackmailed. See, that has every element you're looking for right there. You don't know who Simon is. You don't know what's going on. And you know nothing about the story. But you're hooked. And it's not violence. It's uh, just a conflict. This is a person in an in a auditorium who's suddenly realizing a conversation that he's in is much more precarious than he thought. Later, why, how and why they got to that point is backfilled uh, very expertly by uh, Becky. But at the very beginning, you don't know. But the point is, there's a conflict there and it hooks you. So I ask people to examine your works. And at the very beginning, if you're looking for why you don't think it launches, just figure out, is there a bunch of stuff at the top above my conflict that I could just get rid of that I just don't need? Because if it is, do it. And then cut that information up and supply it to the reader in little pieces as you go forward from that point. Uh, I found that to be a good way to, to keep action going. Uh, I've also found that, you know, never have a character moving from one place to another unless that movement is important. Uh, if they're ending one scene and you want to, the next action starts in somewhere else, don't transition them by like showing us get there. Just cut, just cut straight to the next action. Uh, and these are ways you can increase the pace, uh, keep the tension high and not lose any sort of filler time. So that's my tip. Uh, and I wanted to thank everybody uh, who came on this morning. Uh, Y'all Right has been brought to you by a planning committee who worked very, very hard to put this together. So I do want to name them individually. This year's planning committee for 2020 was Cami Garcia, Summon Chinani, Danielle Page, Veronica Roth, Alex London, and me, Brendan Reichs. Uh, we are hoping you're enjoying our programming. We have so much good stuff today. I cannot uh, not say thank you to our background team who's been handling literally everything and you have no idea how much they handle. So Tori Hill, Shane Pangram, and Francis Oliver, thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. Uh, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day at Y'all Right. We have a lot of stuff lined up, so please keep with us. And thank you for joining us for Breakfast with Y'all Right. Mug and everything. All right. And signing off, this is Brendan Rex. Thank you so much.